Good morning. Um, we're going to begin this study or continue this study on Judges, uh, putting it on a line, and we're going to look at Judges 7 today. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful once again to be able to come before you and uh, to join together as we study your word. We invite your spirit's presence in our midst that you can bring a conviction upon us and strengthen us. We pray for each person. We know the, the difficulties we all face as we go through life and as we seek to know you so we just ask for your angels care and protection over each one and also I'll be with those that we love and care for help us in our influence to reflect your character we pray for wisdom in the topics that we have been going through in the book of judges and we just ask that you can help us see clearly all of the elements that we need at this time be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> um, so good morning, everyone. We're continuing the study on Judges, and we had looked at Judges chapter 6, and we had uh, placed Gideon, the story of Gideon, which I have on the whiteboard here behind me, um, addressing... Um, the symbol of these messages. So the message of Sisera. Uh, um, we had addressed as being, um, how did we do that? So, so when we had dealt with Sisera, and I'm just going back here a little bit, uh, we had addressed with um, uh, the place Sisera is the message of Parminder. Yeah, of Parminder, and that was this, uh, the story of Deborah and Barak. And now we're looking at what happens after. So the way that we're looking at the story of Gideon is that this is the message of July 18th. But it, there's this connection between what happens with the end of Parminder, his message, and with the rise of this other message. So as we try to go through these stories of these messages that come to the movement, there is a um, an overlap that occurs. And, and I'm not really sure how to how to address this because we do have sometimes we have a repeat and enlarge um, when we're going through these lines and, and we haven't really defined them as lines yet we're just we're just taking this period from 2001 to 2023 saying that the period of judges represents within our movement um, uh, though that period of time and that's based upon judges chapter 2 verse 1 to 23 so we had looked at that and now we looked at the end of Parminder's movement and we had all these chron chronological details. And now we've got into the story of Gideon. And in the story of Gideon, we have this uh, connection to um, uh, July 18th prediction. Now, yesterday, when we had looked at um, at the call of Gideon, what were some of the main things that we addressed? What were some of the points that helped us to understand um, that this message connects us to this transition from now that Parminder's out of the way, that there is still this inner element that has to be addressed within I guess we would call it the alpha movement. So Parminder's the Omega. That's how we used to uh, call it, the Omega movement. It's gone, but the alpha movement is still affected. And, and so what is this influence that we see with the Midianites? And 
because we, we need to address this point again just to make sure it's clear. Because we well, meeting tonight. Yep. Okay. Okay. When we're going through this, especially with the Midianites, there was one verse that, that was sticking out to me that we really hadn't delved directly into. But what we have in this, <clears throat> Gideon being a message, and we're applying this as Gideon is the message of July 18th. We have in yeah. verse six in verse six twenty seven, we have Gideon taking ten men of his servants to perform the action that he was instructed to perform. And they did this because Gideon feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day that he did it by night. Mm -hmm. So did we, did we ever pin down why, I mean, this, this example, this, this symbol of the father's household and the men of the city, did we pin down what those are? No, no, we hadn't. And, and I think you're bringing up an important point. So, so we'll come back okay. to that. One is we see some symbols well, I, that we didn't address. And, so the first thing is we know that the Midianites represent strife, right? That's what the word Midian means, strife. And that this is going to open the door for the Amalekites and the children of the East, right? Which we say are messages. Correct. And because, that is because we have this strife that occurs within the movement. It's opening the door for false messages to come in and affect the movement, which are, are symbolized by Amalek, which is, of course, that's the backbiting, that's the gossip and rumors, the attacking of people. And then we also have the children of the East, which we know would symbolize a message regarding Islam. That's generally how we would look at it, right? And so, so we need to understand what that means, what that's symbolizing in this movement at this time. Now, you bring up this point regarding Judges 6.27. Now, they're not going to do it by day, <coughs> but they're going to do it by night. That is, they're going to fulfill right. this, taking down this altar and also building this new altar and offering this bullock upon it, right? So they're going to do this at nighttime, not daytime, right. correct? Okay. And, and this bullock here... Um, because it, it calls it the second bullock, but really it's a bullock of seven years old. And, and why they translated it as second bullock, I mean, we don't know. Um, now, some speculation when I read about this is that um, when it's a second bullock, the idea that, that the translators might have had is that um, there was actually, this is like the... There's bullocks that are chosen, and this is the one that was uh, to be offered at some other time. But a lot of this is sort of speculation. It's just take again the bullock and offer a sacrifice. So the idea is, though, that this is, is some it, kind of repetition. What's that? Is it possible that this could be the second bullock of a team of bullocks? Yeah, something like that. Some kind of bullock that's been set aside as a second, designated in that way. But but it's just a guess, right? I mean, the idea is it's a repetition. So the idea of the word that's been translated as second uh, means properly double. That is second, also again, adverbally again. So if it's an adverb, it would be again. So, 
or this it could be the idea of a second time. But so here it's not clear. All the commentators just say we don't know really what's going on here. There is only one bullock that's mentioned. There isn't two, and but yet it still has this de designation as second or as a gen bullock or the double bullock. So it could be maybe that is the second bullock in a team. I don't know. In the sense that there's two bullocks, um, but. But it, it's again, it's just speculation. I don't know why. But anyway, it's seven years old. So we know that that is a symbol of the 2520. But they're going to do right. it by night. Now, the interesting thing, and I know this, to me, this is always very obscure to look at the Hebrew word, but the number there is 3915. So, so we it, have 391 and a half. Right. So we have that symbol of the 391.5. And so if we're going to say that it's going to be done by night, that's that means it's sort of hidden, right? It's not in, in direct view. Right. And and this sort of hidden would, is a good way of putting it. Yeah, and this would be a way of understanding the message of Gideon. If it's symbolizing July 18th, one thing we can see about the July 18th uh, prediction is the understanding of it is something that was was really hidden. It's something that has to be uh, seen by having light brought to it. It's not something on the surface, right? It's not by day. It's by night. And so that's not a negative thing here. It's it's just uh, the reality. And night here is just Lila. That's the common word for night that you would see like in Genesis chapter one. <clears throat> so so we also have it's in Judges six twenty seven. So what does six twenty seven represent? This might be a bit more obscure. Not everybody would know. 27th day of the sixth month. Well, yes. On what calendar? What year? Well, I would wonder if that wasn't on the on the Julian calendar. Well, it would be the Gregorian calendar in 1844. Now, Iran puts Pentecost, so. Um, so he's he's close there. You have uh, 627 BC. Okay, you have 627. So that's when. Yeah, so uh, you have Jeremiah beginning his ministry. Yeah. And that's where the 300, that's where the 40 years begin. Right. right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so the 40 years for Judah. So it's connected with that. Uh, 390 and 40, right from Ezekiel chapter 4. Now, in on when you, when you, okay, what do I? When you were when you were also looking at this on the uh, Hebrew 3 391.5, yeah, that the a, a secondary definition on this. <clears throat> yes, it would be night, but it could also be adversity. Okay. And wasn't the message wasn't the message of July 18th presented in adversity, both within the movement and the world? Um, yes. Yeah. So that's going to be figuratively adversity. Um, yeah. Right, um, but but I think another thing is um, it also means protective shadow. Okay. So in the sense that it's it's by night it's concealed in some way, but um, so the other thing of six twenty seven. So when Iran wrote their Pentecost in on June twenty second, uh, eighteen forty four, that's going to be Samuel Snow's Pentecost letter. 
That's June 22nd, and that's going to be on Pentecost. So on the Julian calendar, it's June 22nd, but on the biblical calendar, it's going to be the sixth day of the third month. But that letter is going to be published on on June 27th. So it's written on June 22nd, but it's published on June 27th. And this 622 and the 627 go together um, as a sort of a, a tie together, because if we take the biblical date of that's June 27th, 1844, it's going to be the 11th day of the third month. And if you double it, it becomes the date on the Gregorian calendar that the letter was written. So it becomes one of these little puzzle symbols. That is, it's a symbol of a puzzle. That's part of the way that I take this 627. And so if you're going to also tie it to the 391.5, something that's hidden, that's under this protective shadow, um, this would have to be this message of July 18th that's being symbolized there. So it would tie in with what we understand um, regarding July 18th. So it's just more symbols that attach to this. And the number 10 referring to a test would also um, symbolize that. The 10 men of his servants. But, okay. What? What would we figuratively give application for of his father's household and the men of the city? So, so that's who they fear, the father's household and the men of the city. So, so, right. so we, we would say, well, if we're going to look at this message of July 18th and why – because this is not talking about a person here in this time. This would be talking about a message, or at least symbolically figuring um, this message. So it is true, the development of July 18th, especially after it's rejected by FFA, um, wouldn't the father's household and the men of the city represent the movement um, that has rejected the message until it's well, accepted. I'm I'm asking as I'm as I'm reading through this, if the father's household represents FFA and the men of the city represent the corporate church. Yeah, possibly. So. Uh, yeah, so it could represent all those who have opposition to this message, to this movement, specifically to uh, the ideas that led to July 18. So, right. So it would represent some kind of opposition, because it is an opposition here, literally, but it would represent the opposition that occurred during this time that this message is being understood. So it's not that we were trying to do things clandestinely in the sense of, you know, plotting and, and so forth. But we were sort right. of forced into a situation when we studied July 18th to set it aside. And me, Odilio, and Stephen were the ones primarily studying it um, and just have these private conversations. We weren't doing this publicly within the movement. Like it was originally presented publicly, but it was within, you know, a month. Um, it was it was pretty much shut down. Well, even, even while I was still in the Arkansas, isn't that also kind of like what what was going on with the uh, Thanksgiving prediction that you were you were studying? Mm hmm. Yeah. So the pattern was being established that FFA did not wish to study these things. They were more interested, and here again, I speak figuratively, in holding on to their idols. Mm -hmm. That 
this the the holding on to the idols was important and they wished to continue their worship in the way that they saw best rather than the way in which you Stephen and Odilio were being led mm-hmm. now does that fall within the pattern that we're addressing yes so that then that's what I'm trying to say here is that this is referring to that that initial work so you're going to have this work of Gideon that's first going to occur is this taking down of this altar of Baal and offering this bullock that's seven years old. Right. And, and that's going to be done by night. So, so they first do this. So, this is, to me, the first development of July 18. And, um, and then there's going to be the two tests, right? So the two tests... I believe come as as we noted yesterday uh, there's two specific things so what were the two specific things that i said that were these tests that there's the fleece what were they representing the signs of the fleece people remember Yes, uh, you mentioned that it was more the numbers. Okay, the numbers. Sort of, connection, sort yeah. of um, secondary witnesses, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, you maybe like um, you mentioned the um, the dates connected with the atomic bombs in right. Japan. Right. So, so that, all that of type those- of thing. Right, so all those things that pointed to this atomic bomb, these secondary witnesses, um, but specifically regarding these spans of time and these dates that tied us to Millerite history. Right, so there's not just the dates itself dealing with Hiroshima, um, but there's also its connections, which I didn't go into, but its connections to uh the July 18, 2020 prediction as far as the spans of time. And we have like 391 weeks and five days or something like that, right? Is that the number, Stephen? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, 300 and... 3,910 weeks. Oh, yeah, 3,910 weeks. And five days. And five days, that was it. Yeah, which was 27,375 days. Um, from Hiroshima to July 18, 2020. So we had this symbol of the 391.5. So, so there was all of these things regarding this. Um, you know, it was from July 27th, 1299. It was 666 lunar years or 340 metonic cycles. Um, uh, or th- oh, 34 metonic cycles. And there was all different kinds of things. So I'm not going to go into all these different um, symbols. But these, to us, uh, regarding the attack on Nashville, we had it tied to a nuclear attack, the first nuclear attack by the United States on Japan. And Japan can symbolize Islam. It has some of the same symbols. And so so this was more witnesses. And the other one was the 273, the 273 that uh, came from the Mayan calendar witness. So, so we continue to have all these witnesses, and those to me were the fleece. Those were the things for us that this was true and that this needed to be heard. But FFA is then going to pick up the message. So it's not going to be left to us to do this work. The movement is going to take up the work. Now... <clears throat> 
this message of Gideon's 300 men then would have to relate to the, to the Nashville warning itself. But we expected something quite different from this Nashville warning, right? From what was going to happen. So we looked at this story of Gideon as based upon our biases, our, our prejudices, that this meant that this movement was going to be victorious with the Nashville prediction. That's how we understood it, correct? Yes. Okay. And now, when we deal with the story of Gideon and his 300 men, how it had we applied it previously, before we had July 18th or time setting or anything like that? We, we did a study on what Jeff said about the story of Gideon. And, and how had we applied it? Story of Gideon is going to represent what? Was it the light cry? Yeah, so it's going to be the loud cry, which is connected to the Sunday law, right? Yes. Okay. So, so here this movement has taken something that, that not only just this movement is understood. I think many Adventists would have connected the story of Gideon to the loud cry, to the message of the Sunday law. Uh, but... This movement chose to take this story of Gideon and apply it specifically to the July 18, 2020 prediction, correct? Correct. Yeah, so, so it's kind of interesting that we did that because that means that we, in some ways, and I mean, I know in many ways, we saw that what was happening with Nashville was typical of the Sunday law. It is, we didn't think it was the Sunday law, but we did think it was leading to the Sunday law, just as the pandemic was typical of the Sunday law and leading to the Sunday law. So, so why did we do that? Why were we taking things that we had applied earlier to something on the big line, so to speak, and now applying it to our line? What was happening? More of a refinement of our understanding. Okay. Now, now we could say it's a refinement, but we were right before that it does apply to the Sunday law. Fractals. No disagreement. Okay, Stephen? Okay, uh, fractals. Okay, fractals. Fractals. Okay, so, well, so we're zooming in, just like you would on a fractal, and you're going to see the same pattern. But are we really aware that that's what we're doing? You know, back then, are we, we, do we seem to be aware, even though we know about fractals and we know about types, is the movement aware of what it's doing? If the movement was aware of what it's doing, could it had would it have experienced a disappointment? No. Right. So it wouldn't have. So the movement had to be unaware of what it was doing. It was taking all of these things that were types and symbols. And we were being warned that it was types and symbols by the lines themselves that 
Nashville was not going to be hit by a fireball or be attacked by Islam on July 18, 2020. We were being told that, but we were unwilling to listen. because we didn't understand that we were zoomed into a fractal. Now, just to get to back to fractals a bit, I mean, I've never really been a fan of the fractal idea, uh, though it's correct, um, just because it's a little bit confusing to people. But you know if you take a fractal pattern and you see this pattern and you zoom into a portion of it, you will see the same pattern again. And and. And this is just what we see in nature. And this is what we see happening in these lines. As we zoom in to a way mark, we're gonna have a reform line. And so our movement was zooming into a way mark and we still haven't defined these way marks yet. So that's one of the things that we have to get done. By the time we're done this, we need to be able to see at what level we are zoomed in. Um, in the events that are happening to us at the present time. Uh, because definitely we're not on the big line. We're not at the Sunday law. We're not at midnight on the big line. And, and, when, and that when I'm talking about the big line, even midnight on the big line, there is no midnight on the big line in, in the sense of Ellen White's line. There's just the Sunday law, the loud cry, the close of probation. So the midnight, midnight cry is something that's for the Levites, and that's also a zoom in to the Sunday law. But we're not even to that midnight yet. So, so this is what we have to understand. This is what, what would become clear, where this movement is and what its role is at the present time. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail because, you know, we've gone through this, but we know that there is this whittling down. So Gideon has these, all of these, um, it's what, 22,000 men who come to fight that meet Gideon. No, it's uh, 32,000. It's 32? Oh, there's yes, 32, then... 32. So there's 32,000, pardon me, yes. And you're going to have 22,000 return and 10,000 remaining. That's what happens. Now, we have this 10,000 again. Now, what would be the significance of this 32,000, 22,000 return and 10,000 remain? Where would we mark this? Can we mark this at some point of time within this movement? Because it would be a dividing point. Okay, so Iran says it's similar to the 220 and the 2300. So that's the 2520. But here we have 32, so it's a reverse of 2300. <clears throat> but can we mark this at some point in this movement where the movement is whittled down in some way? And, and what, how would we Wouldn't use this be to show that? Wouldn't this be similar to what we saw in the Millerite time frame? Yes. But where are we going to mark it in our time? <clears throat> so remember, we saw um, this... Uh, 10,000 as a symbol of 273. Okay, so Ram's going to put November 9th, 2019. So with a question mark.
and that's that's you know a really good guess because we know that there is a division that occurs in this movement connected with November 9th, 2019. So remember, Jeff wakes up on September 7th, and gives his last uh, presentation at Lambert Church. So 2019 on September 7th. And then there's going to be these 63 days um, to November 9th. And so there are people who are going to accept Jeff's message. But is everyone going to stay with the movement from September 6th to November 9th and, and afterwards? Are we going to have a lot of people even leave the movement after November 9th? Yeah. Yeah. And part of it is because we have uh, July 18th being presented, right? Jeff is Correct. getting lots of opposition. There are many people who's telling Jeff, we don't want any more time setting. That was Parminder's error, right? Agreed. Mm -hmm. So Jeff is having to deal with all these people who are saying, don't listen to this July 18th prediction. It's just more of the same that we got from Parminder. You're making a big mistake. Don't do it, right? Leave, set, put away time setting. But Jeff recognizes that everything that he's ever taught has been leading to this July 18, 2020 prediction. Everything focuses upon that. And he realizes that his movement is tied to July 18, 2020, and that whether or not the event occurs, that is the end of his movement. That is, he's going to retire on July 18, 2020. Doesn't matter what happens. Okay. So I would say November 9th is um, a good way of looking at it. Now, we had dealt with this uh, 10,000 that's left. And remember, 10,000 is 27.3 years with a decimal after that. But we can see that it represents this uh, symbol of the message um, to uh, um, to the Levites, right? Now, the other thing is we also could count 10,000 days that would end on March 27th, 2017. And that would begin on November 9th, 1989. So can we see that this symbol of November 9th, 1989, is connected to the symbol of March 27th? And, and we have November 9th, 2019. So would those that remain, the 10,000 that remain, they're the ones left to give a message to the Levites, but they also are the ones who accept the time of the end is November 9th, 1989. Is that what the 10,000 represent? Do people follow what I did? <clears throat> and th this would give witness to November 9th, 2019, as being the separating point. So just, just to see this a bit more clearly, so I'm just going to use this calendar converter here. So here I have November 9th, 1989. And I'm going to count 10,000 days. And that's going to bring me to March 27th, 2017. Now, March 27th is a symbol of the message to the Levites. And this is in connection with a structure that has to do with this 777 chiasm. 
and this March 27th date is um, uh, three days after 777 days after a part of this structure. I'm not going to go into the whole structure. So March 27, 2017 is tied to that. Now, if we go to November 9th, 2019, we know that that's going to be 30 years from November 9th, 1989. And so we're saying that the separation that occurs, the symbol is there um, of November 9th, but also the symbol of the 10,000. So those are the ones that are accepting the message of July 18th. Okay, right? We would say that that's November 9th. They're, they're accepting the history of the past. They're accepting the responsibility to give a message to the Levites. So when would the next separation occur? So you're going to have, um, he's going to say that's too many. I want you to go down to the water and you're going to choose those that um, bring the water to their mouths, right? Not the ones that go down on their knees and put their, uh, you know, drink from the water. You want the ones that bring the water up to their mouth, right? So you're going to have 300 that lap from their hands and you're going to have all the rest that are going to be um, putting their head down into the water. So what does this symbolize and when does this occur? Any thoughts? Does it occur after the full page ad was taken out? Okay. So, so we, we know we have November 9th, and now we're going to have, um, uh, so November 9th, 2019. We're going to have the July 18, 2020 prediction. So there's going to be people that are still in the movement after November 9th but a separation is going to occur um, that's going to bring the 300. And the 300 are the ones that are going to uh, break the pitchers, right? Hold up their torches and sound the trumpets. So this would have to be the people giving a message. So there's going to be 300 left. Okay, so why why would you say it's after the publication? Do you think there's a major separation that occurs after the publication of the warning? Well, I think that there's a we we know that there's a separation that's going to occur before that ad goes out, but there are going to be many that will become less enthused about this message with this ad going out because now it's a public proclamation it's an exposure that this message is important and there's going to be questions in many minds is this what we are to be doing okay so we know because that they have they go ahead well we know that they um there was a lot going on that i don't know about uh behind the scenes regarding the publication, whether it should go on or not. Um, I was involved in preparing the website initially, and that was just removed from me without talking to me. And, and the website was not done how I thought it should have been done. Right. So originally we had written all of these articles by different people, and it was going to be a website where people could get information. Um, it wasn't going to give all the information at once. It was going to give basically uh, an introduction to what we were predicting and, and give a lot of background so that people could study uh, what this message was about. 
but instead they made it sort of a one page um, Jeff wrote it all out himself and and then they also published uh, the, the article in in the Tennessean and again so much information was given up front I mean I understood it we needed to give a warning but there was differences of opinion on how this should be done so I don't know uh, definitely there's something going on there but is there anything in the symbols that are here that would would tie you to that conclusion so because we have all these symbols so that we have the water and waters can represent people right the waters can represent the people of the world so you're going to have some who want to put their face down to the water and drink directly from the water, but you have 300 who want to bring the water up to their hands. What would that symbolize and how would you tie it to what you're saying? Well, okay. The bringing the water up with their hands is requiring some effort. Okay. It's requiring it's requiring an effort very different from putting your face down to the water. Okay. Yeah. But it, it, it also symbolizes a different way in which we're re interacting with the world. If this is about a message. Right. Correct. Okay. But that so, also, it, that, that comes right in line with what I'm saying mm -hmm. because when you're, when you're having to place your hand into the water and bring the water up, that is a, um, it's a greater effort. But you're also bringing the people to more, you, right? Right. Where in the other one, you're bowing down to the people. Right. And if you're bowing down to the people, you're you're basically also bowing down to an idol. Yes. Okay. Symbolically. Right. So you have two groups. You have one who cares about people's opinions. Right. Right. The opinion of the world. What does the world think about us? And another group who right. is to save the world, to bring them out of the world. Yes. Agreed. Okay. So to me, that makes sense. There seems to be a logic here that would go with what you're saying. Now, exactly how we would uh, place that um, as a date, we might say June 22nd, 2020, you know, okay. if we're gonna give a date to it, uh, because that's gonna be the date when the message goes to the world. Um, but in some ways, we have to look at this proclamation as the sounding of this message itself, right? So this isn't going to be, um, we're, we're looking at this to be some kind of victory that's going to occur on July 18th that will empower the message so that we can give a message to the world. Right. But that, that doesn't happen on July 18th. But we do give a message to the world. We do sound the trumpets. And we do break the pictures. Now, the breaking of the pictures, I always liken to the death to self. So self is set aside because we have this treasure in earth and vessels, right? And self has to die okay. in order for the light of Christ's character to shine forth. So... I would say that with the failure of July 18th, this is something that does, if that message is accepted, uh, cause the death of self and cause Christ's character to shine forth and allows us to give the warning message. Now, the warning message, the message, Gideon represents the July 18th message, but it's much more than that we would still have to say that this message is about a proclamation of the coming Sunday law. And, and we could even argue 
that July 18th is the point in which this separation occurs. Definitely it occurs somewhere from June 22nd, 2020 to December 6th, 2020. That you have the 300. Now the 300 symbolize those who are faithful to the message of July 18th and continue to accept the message of July 18th. Any, any thoughts on this, about the date? If we're going to just give a date for it. Well, I think that the July, or the, excuse me, the June 22nd can work. Okay, so June 22nd can work. Okay, any other thoughts on that? I mean, I don't know if we have to nail it down to a specific date, but we definitely need to um, understand how this relates to the, this, this symbol relates to the separation. So if it is June 22nd, wouldn't that be roughly 25 days before July 18th? Um, yes, it's 25 days before July 18th. So would that also not be a symbol of the wise virgins five by five? Yeah, I think it's, is it 25 or 26? Depends on what method you use to count it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so it's going to be 25 days intervening between um, from the end of June 22nd to the beginning of July 18th. There's 25 days. Yeah, so... <clears throat> um, so we call that an exclusive count. It excludes the beginning and the start date. You exclude uh, June 22nd and you exclude July 18th itself. There's 25 days between. Okay. Um, definitely they're tied together. Right. We, we would have to we would have to say that this proclamation made um, is, is tied to that. So the publication in the Tennessean on the 21st of June, which is then gets international attention uh, on the 22nd of June. <clears throat> and the Adventist Church becomes aware of it because of this. It, it gets. The Adventist Church was not aware of any of this stuff we were doing until June 22nd. That is, the Biblical Research Institute didn't know anything about the 2520 or what we were doing, um, anything that this movement was doing. But for the first time, we not just got international attention, but we got the attention of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first time. <clears throat> um, you know, not local conferences or things like that, but the general conference. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. So now, of course, some people wouldn't be happy about that because we'd look at it as pretty negative. <clears throat> and I know my, my pastor got a phone call. So there's a group of pastors. They're the, the important pastors in the world. They meet together, and they heard about this, and they knew it was me who had made this prediction, 
And so they contacted my pastor. So he said the fact that he got a phone call from this group of pastors, um, worldwide group of pastors who are all the important ones in Adventism, to ask about me, he says, you definitely got somebody's attention. So <clears throat> I don't really understand who these people are, but you know, this movement got noticed with the July 18th predict prediction. So we can say that the publication then on the June 21st, June 22nd, uh, that that was noticed, that would have created a separation in this movement in some way. You know, how many people were unhappy with that publication of of the warning and 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 allowed them after July 18th to reject July 18th as well. So there may have been people who were opposed to giving this warning, right, apprehensive about it. Um, and when July 18th didn't occur, definitely they would have fallen away. So the 300 that are left are not just to be there before July 18th. They need to be there after July 18th. Would we agree with that? There's no other way for it to work but for that to be correct. Okay. So in this story of Gideon, these 300 men that are going to deliver us from the Midianites, if we're taking the Midianites as representing this um, strife that exists, right? This criticism of others that has opened up the door for the Amalekites and the children of the East. Because this is the enemy that's, that's being opposed here. God is giving us this message of July 18th to do a specific work that has to be done for this movement to fulfill its role. And that work isn't just about predicting things. It's about an internal work that has to happen. Now, <clears throat> and there's lots to this story. So um, we know that what's going to happen is uh, they're going to break these pitchers. They're going to let these torch torches shine. They're going to sound the trumpet. And they're going to defeat Midian. But has that happened yet? I would think that it's yet to happen. Yes. So this has not happened yet, right? And right. So so this message of Gideon, even though it's about July 18th, the de the defeat of the Midianites has not yet occurred. We can't place this as something past in our movement. We were hoping that it was going to happen with July 18th, the event itself happening. But we can see that that's not what it's about. It is a message of July 18th, but that means the message of July 18th must be something more than just about a message of what was going to happen at Nashville. And we weren't able to see that. Right. Now, the one that's interesting to me is Judges 7.23. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers through all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters of Beth Bara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. And, and then they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb. And Zeb, they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, 
and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of other side Jordan. So we know that there's going to be this gathering together of all of these different people out of Naphtali, Asher, Manasseh, plus this call to Ephraim. Now this still must be future. Right? Because if the story of the blowing of the trumpets and the breaking of the pitchers and the victory over the Midianites is future, then this calling these other um, Israelites. No disagreement. Right. Yeah. So we would have to say this is future. And this is where uh, this movement is, is moving towards something that only can occur when strife is defeated. Now, do we remember anything about Oreb and Zeb? How did we understand these two? Oreb meaning, um, uh, if I remember correctly, a raven and Zeb representing a wolf. So if we're going we're gonna to say that the Midianites are this criticism, a raven and a wolf, what would they represent? If these are the two princes of the Midianites, of strife, a raven and a wolf. Are you saying they would represent strife? So Midianites represent strife. That's what the name Midianite means. It means okay. strife. And right. Orb means a raven and Zeb means a wolf. So what would they symbolize in regard to that? that they're defeated. They're two princes of strife. <clears throat> okay, so two princes, are they two types of strife? Or are they two segments that unite to give strife to the movement? Okay. Well, well. The, so we're always taking these things as as characteristics or or you know messages. So they're two princes of the Midianites. So the Midianites represent strife, which which I believe represents this sort of criticism that we have within this movement, this conflict, this disunity. But we're going to have the to... Criticism is the best way of placing it. Yeah. So Orb and Zeb represent these two chief characteristics of the Midianites. So we can understand a wolf quite well, right? What's a wolf, biblically speaking? One that comes in among the flock to destroy. Right. And, and we know that, that they can do that often in sheep's clothing, too. So, I mean, wolves aren't always perceived. <coughs> but what about a raven itself? Doesn't a raven pick at carrion? Well, this one thing it does, yep. Yeah. Um, so just Angela directed, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And also of your own selves, Shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them? <clears throat> so, yeah, so ravens will um, deal with carrion, right? So 
like, I mean, they eat what they can scavenge. They're scavengers. So what would they, what characteristic would they represent within the movement? Maybe those who pick at, um, pick, pick at things or. Yeah, pick at flaws. Yeah, maybe pick at flaws, maybe something like that. That's what I was going to say. Okay. And I would think that this is, I mean, this is related to the idea of criticism. So when we look at people, can we pick at flaws? Yeah, easily. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least if you're looking at me, you can find lots of flaws. But Ellen White says we shouldn't do that. That when we, we deal with people, we need to see them as Christ sees them. Right. Right. People have things that annoy us. I mean, a person's voice can annoy us, or their mannerisms, or they talk too much, or, you know, all kinds of things that we can think about a person that we don't like. Um, you know, they maybe interrupt us when we're talking, or they seem to be dismissive, or, or they're arrogant, or whatever we want to imagine about a person. Instead of listening to what a person is saying, instead of examining what a person is saying, we examine the person and decide that we don't need to listen to the message because we don't like the messenger. Now, as far as comparing scripture with script, scripture, I mean, there isn't a lot to be said about ravens i mean we know that ravens were sent out um from the ark uh, we know that god created ravens and um they would be i believe uh, oh the other thing we know about ravens of course is um let me see where is this here um, that they're going to, uh, this is Isaiah 34, 11, um, dealing with the fall of Babylon, uh, but the cormorant, the bittern shall possess it, the owl also, and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. So this is talking about Babylon, its destruction, uh, if I remember, the judgment of the nation specifically, I guess. Um, so the raven is something, as uh, I think Dwight pointed out, you know, it dwells upon carrion, it feeds upon carrion, picks at it. But we can see that this is not something desirable. But I think it's interesting he stretches out, out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. And I, I think when I think about criticism, the type of thing of picking at people's flaws in their character, things that annoy us, um, it actually doesn't benefit to the understanding of truth. And I like the word stones of emptiness. I mean, I don't know if that's... Uh, uh, you know exactly what that means, but it's just a visual image. Um, it's it, emptiness means superficiality. You know, aren't we being superficial? Aren't we when we when we pick at people's characters instead of studying things? Aren't we? Um, being superficial. Well, stones of emptiness. Mm -hmm. uh, think of it this way. What if a stone of emptiness is a lot like a dirt clod? You have what looks to be something firm, but it's not. It's uh. something that 
when it hits, it just, it, it falls apart. Mm -hmm. So in these situations, especially when they are throwing stones of emptiness, is this not very much in that same vein where there's nothing substantial to what they're saying. They're just trying to obscure what's really going on. Okay. And that, and that's what's that, and that enemy needs to be defeated in each of us. Yes. And, and we're going to make a call. Gideon's going to send out messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites. So Ephraim, of course, the largest of the tribes in northern Israel. Um, but the men of Naphtali, of Asher, and of Manasseh, they're going to also pursue. So we know that the things that we have been studying are leading somewhere. And they're leading to something that's still in the future. But it's about a message that goes to the Levites. It's a message that goes to those who are searching for truth. Our work is not yet completed. It's a message that goes to those that are treating the scripture as mining for gold and precious jewels. Yeah. Yes. Now, the other thing, when they take their trumpets and they blow them, with with the yeah so people are are mining for truth so I, I'm, I'm not we know that we have to understand truth and there are people looking for truth those are the are the ones that are going to heed the call um but i want to go back here too with this um uh when they blow the trumpets it says the lord set every man's sword against his fellow now, one thing that I see all the time, when you have um, groups like what we see with FFA, uh, they're quite critical of the church. People who are critical of the church will join themselves <clears throat> with independent ministries, with different offshoots within Adventism. Because they're critical people. But they end up taking their swords against their fellow men as well. They're not used to cooperating and working with others. And it's something I've seen in the movement, that people, people who are critical of the church in the way that they are, are critical of each other. <clears throat> You know, if you're if you meet somebody and you're talking to them and and they have stories about other people all the time. One thing you can be quite certain is that after they've met you, they're going to have stories about you, right? Yeah, I mean, if they're talking about others, they're talking about you, too. Yeah. So when somebody comes to me and they're, they're gossips, I mean, one is I won't listen to them. But the other thing I know is anything I tell them, they're going to take and they're going to tell it to others in some kind of distorted fashion. Just like the things they've told me about others are going to be presented in a distorted fashion, right? Because they have to make it as sensational and as salacious as they can, right? But we times, see yes. Yeah, so every man's sword is going to be against his fellow. That those that are critical, that might gang up against some supposed enemy, person who has flaws, who's presenting light that they're attacking, they readily turn against each other. That's their nature. Unless they're converted, that's not going to change.
So I'm, and I'm sure it's something we're all aware of. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> now, um, we're, we're going to look at this uh, dealing, uh, this, this the, the, when Gideon defeats Zeba and Zalmuna, we're going to look at that a bit more and try to figure out what this is about, because I don't think we have time really to look at it. Uh, but remember, when we went through this story, there was lots there. Um, it's not a simple story. And then you're going to have, you know, Gideon's ephod, the death of Gideon, and then you're going to have Abimelech, right? So we're going to have all of these things that happen, and we have to decide how we're going to put these on a line. Because the way that I understand it is that Gideon's going to be, as we go through the story, it's going to be a repeat and enlarge. That is, we can't take this whole story and just make it um, successive as we apply it to this movement. Does that make sense to people? Yes, thanks, Paul. Okay. And so there's going to be different aspects of the message that are going to be addressed as we go through the rest of these, these judges, these stories. So when you have a particular story, it it sometimes follows from the previous story, and that, that it's there's a successive movement from one story to the next. But sometimes that story just repeats and enlarges the previous story. It adds more details to it. So this part about Gideon's three hundred men, uh, to me, is this choosing of these people who are going to give this message. It symbolizes the message of the 300. And this is a message uh, that separates out a group of people who are specifically going to attack this type of criticism that exists. But we know when we do that, we, we also know that this also this represents the Sunday law. That's what we've always taken the story of Gideon's 300 men to represent the Sunday law. Now, where else do we have the 300? Where else do we get this symbol of the 300? Well, we have 3,000. OK, you have 3,000. At Pentecost. OK, so 3,000 at Pentecost. And, and there's definitely a connection there. But what about the 300 itself? It, it's, it's a bit more obscure. I recall that E.G. White had mentioned 300 passengers on the ship, but there are actually 276, so she rounded it up. Okay, so, so we have Acts 27? Yeah. Yeah, which she calls 300. Yeah, okay, so that's an important point because... The one that I'm thinking of um, is in Numbers chapter 3. So we know Numbers chapter 3 and Acts 27 relate to the seven, uh, 273, right? Both of them. And in, in Numbers, in, in numbers uh, when you add up these, the numbers of these different uh, tribes and the numbers of the firstborn, um, you're going to have uh, 22,273 of all the firstborn males 
of the tribes of all the different tribes. Right? And it says that these are going to be um, 273 more than the numbers of all of the children of, of the Levites. Right? So people remember this, right? And there's going to be this redemption money that's paid. So they're going to take this number 273. So they're saying that there's 2,200 um, or 22,200 um, children of the Levites, right? So you're going to have these numbers of, of, of uh, the names. I always forget all the names. Um, Kohath, Gershon, and Merari. Right. And so they're going to number them. Now, when you add them together, what number do you get? Because you're going to have 7,500 plus um, 8,600 plus um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, the final one. Uh, 6,200, so there's 6,208. Um, so if you add those together, 8,600, 6,200, and 7,500, what do you get? Is it uh, 23,000? 22,300. Now, in verse 39, it says, All that were numbered of the Levites, which Moses and Aaron numbered, at the commandment of the Lord throughout their families, all the males from a month old and upward, were 22,000. It doesn't say 22,300. So why do they not count 22,300, even though if you took the count that they gave us, it should be 22,300. Instead, they say 22,000. And they're going to do the math based upon that because there's 22,273. And so those that are going need to be redeemed. So, so why is that? Why are 300 left out in the total? Well, I think uh, some have speculated that the 300 may relate to Aaron's family. Yeah, so some is, yeah. Yeah, so it may relate to Aaron's family. There's lots of different theories. Nobody knows why, but 300 are left out. And so that 300 must symbolize a special class of some sort that aren't going to be counted, right? It's not a yep. mistake. They didn't do, you know, some typo, which is, is the most common explanation. Whenever things don't line up with people's thinking, they just say it's a typo. But a typo like this wouldn't exist. That is, you're not going to get a typo like this. There's all these people studying these things, these documents. They're not going to just allow a typo to come in. And they don't correct it. That is, people in the past didn't go through and correct numbers and say, oh, there must have been a mistake here. Let's correct this. They accepted it. They know that discrepancy is there, but they don't have a problem with it because they must understand why it's there. They just don't tell you. So that 300 represents a special class. 
but it's also related to the 273. Can we see that? I'm starting to start. To start. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the 300 is about a message to the Levites. So the Levites are symbolized by 273, but the ones who give that message are the 300. We also need to remember how many charts were made of the 1843 chart. How many ministers went out with those charts? Okay, now mm -hmm. you're, asking, you're asking a question that's actually a bit deeper than you might think. Okay. Now, we're within a minute of the close of today's time. Yeah. With my internet down, the only way I have of sending something is going to be to go to an internet hotspot. Okay. I've got something open before me that I will copy. I will get it off to you so we can address this with the 300 in depth for tomorrow morning's meeting. Okay, good. Yeah, because this is an important point. There's a lot to this 300 that we have to consider. There's a lot more than you might think. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one little piece. Okay. Because we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna deal with this in a, in a few days. How many foxes did Samson catch and tie their tails together? There's the three hundred. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So th there's a bunch of free three hundreds that we have not, we haven't considered, right? So we really need to consider the three hundred. Exactly. So let's let's be prepared for that for tomorrow because this you may you may want to send this out to everybody so that they can take a look at this and we can discuss this in full. Okay, sounds good. All right. Yep. Okay. So thanks for that, Dwight. And we're gonna uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, for the light that has been shining upon our path and for the things that we've been able to see in your word. We know, Lord, that we are often characterized by Oreb and Zeb and that these characteristics in us uh, need to be put to death. They need to be slain upon the rock. And the wine press. We need, Lord, it, your spirit to convict us of our sins, for us to see how far we are from your character and that we are unfit to do this work. Forgive us for our, our sin, for our often open rebellion against you. And forgive us for rejecting light, that you've given uh, to correct us. Be with each person this day. May we reflect your character to all that we come in contact. And may your work be done upon this earth is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.